You know, growing up, that was my dream. You know what I mean? My dream was to make it into the NFL. How'd you find out that? Man. Take us, take us back, walk us through that moment. But I remember leaving and being like, nah, this ain't it. Mm. Cause I felt like I wasn't doing my due diligence when it came to following through and chasing my dreams. And you felt that in that moment? I felt that in that moment. Yeah. Do people know about this? Nobody it's knows okay. about this. Were you embarrassed to say this at the time? So you go from being a bouncer mm -hmm. and not knowing your future, interviewing for corporate roles, and now being, and this was reported that you, you throughout your career, your short career, made under $2 million. It was a time where I had the most money I ever had, and I was the most depressed I ever been. The nickelback for the Buccaneers had been suspended for violating the NFL's policy on performance-enhancing substances, according to a league spokesperson. What happened there? <laughs> How has therapy impacted you? I got to a point to where, like, I was worshiping my ego. Counting forward, that's going to give us, we, got, we probably have about 20, 30 minutes of conversation. Yeah. And that's not a hard rule. We could go over and we can just spice it down. Yeah. But I would love to keep it shorter. Okay. Or we could do part one and two. If it's going really long, we can just do part one and two. We could release it as two different episodes. Oh, okay. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So that's the timing. Just worry about the first paragraph. The second one, I just sent it, but I'm only gonna do the, the stand-up for the first one. So like, but we won't do it. I won't do it sitting down though. It's crazy. Wow. How do you feel about the show? I think the show's gonna be good. What do you, what, um, what are some things you want us to think about as we? I want you to be like extremely comfortable. Uh, so I'm going to have to have a, a private conversation with him before we start shooting. Okay. At the end of the day, like I think where, where, where the power of the story is, is in the journey, but then also like what he learned from the impact of how it affected us. Right. You know what I mean? Because you know, he wants more of it to be about, you know, also to touch on that mental health aspect right. of it as well. But in order, in order to get there, we have to create the foundation of like how that impacted him, you know? True. So like, we have to set the foundation in segment one of like how much he prepared, how much it meant to him, how much he worshiped it. So then people could feel like, then it makes sense, it connects to the end of the story of like why, how, why it was so heavy to him. I think what he said in the free shoot when he said, uh, once he lost football, he didn't know who he was. Mm -hmm. I think that's key to tap into that. All right. You know? Yeah. Thank you, Melanie. Shot, so I'm not worried about it. All right, let's do it. So this football I'm holding in my hand, it represents a huge part of our American culture. 
To put it more clearly, the sports industry here in the U.S. generates $71 billion a year. It's one of the pillars of our entertainment, and many of our lives are centered around the narrative of sports. But what about the players? Take a look. In 2019, sports players earned a combined salary of over $7 billion, which is about 48% of the earnings for the game. Physical toughness is bred into the players, which is required to play at their peak performances, all while dealing with the nuances of now living in the public eye. Things were no different for this guy, Jude Ejay Berima, who played for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers when he went undrafted in 2015. Jude's NFL career lasted almost four years, and he was on his rise to the top. In the spring of 2019, his NFL career came to a halt, and I wanted to find out why. Defensive back Jude A.J. Barima has been suspended by the NFL for four games for performance-enhancing drugs. Today, I sat down with Jude at the Marriott Marquise in my hometown of Chicago. Jude, welcome to Chicago, bro. Man, thank you for having me, man. I'm glad to be here. How has the cold been treating you? I hate it, man. This is the exact reason why I moved out of Ohio and took myself to sunny Florida and sunny Arizona now. So, no, nah, it's cool, though. You know, you get the seasons. I like, you know, being able to switch it up. For sure. Wear for a jacket, sure. you know, and things like that. Well, I'm excited to have you. And to be quite frankly honest, I did not think that you'd do this interview. I don't know why. But when Emmanuel called you back in August to give people context, we connected. And one thing that you said was, I'm ready to tell my story. Yep, yep. What did you mean by that? Just because I feel like, you know, we've known each other, you know, obviously for a while. And so most people know me from afar. Most people know like, you know, oh, Jude or this and that, but they don't really know like, you know, the story behind, you know, Jude and the story behind what it, you know, kind of like my journey and things like that. And I've, re I've never really been, you know, I've never really had a platform to be able to, you know, kind of like tell my story. So. When you called me and offered me the opportunity, man, I jumped on it right away because I was like, man, this is my opportunity right here to, you know, just, you know, open up a little bit, you know what I'm saying, and tell my side of the story. Were you not ready to tell your story? Um, I would say that it, it, it didn't, it wasn't a matter of being ready or not. I think it was more of a matter of just the right time, the right opportunity and the right platform. And obviously being that it was you, like, that like, reached out, it was no, no issue at all. Yeah. I definitely, I like what you have going on already. So I'm always about just adding value. So the fact that you even thought that I could come on here and add some value to this, that's what made me yeah. kind of be like, let's do it. I appreciate that. To give our viewers context, mm -hmm. you played in the NFL. I did. Yeah. So I think for me personally, a lot of people have an idea of what that moment is like or think that if you all of a sudden get the opportunity to do something like be in the NFL or be an entertainer, we can only imagine what that moment is like. Right. But what is the reality of what it's like for you that when you found out that you would have the opportunity to play on such a major platform as that, what we would assume that it would be like, well, what was it like in actuality? Okay, I got you. Yeah, um, so if you think about anything, it's like the pinnacle of it, right? So for me, being a child, you know, growing up, that was my dream. You know what I mean? My dream was to make it into the NFL. Um, and, you know, you, you look at it, there's a lot of things that it took for me to get there. But um, what I will say is that when I got there, it was for me, it was exactly the feeling that I thought, you know, it was going to be the most fulfilling probably thing that I've ever done in my life is knowing that I set to do the goal and the dream of playing in the NFL and then actually getting there and being like, man, I'm with the best of the best. These are the best football players in the world. These are the best coaches in the world. You got 80,000, you know, screaming fans in stadiums that you go to. Um, you're pretty much a role model for kids because, like, growing up, a lot of those players that I looked up to now, I'm playing with some of the players that I used to, you know what I'm saying, play with them on Madden or watch on TV. So for me, it was really like a surreal experience. Like, that first, when you got in there, it's like that first, like, wow, like, you know, I'm in the NFL. How'd you find out that? Man, take us, take us back. Walk us through that moment. I got you. So for most people that don't know, um, it sounds good now, but um, the dream was far, 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 far away from where it ended up being. And for me, like even being here today is like a full circle moment because I remember coming to Chicago after I graduated college because I had a job offer with the Tom James company. Interesting. They sell the custom suits. And, I did not know that. Um, that was going to be my future, actually. 
Interesting. You know what I mean? Because I had a good college career. I had a solid college career, but there wasn't necessarily a lot of like NFL prospects in terms of, you know, agents or, you know, me actually knowing that I would get drafted into the NFL, you know, which is the way most traditionally most people get into the NFL. But I, I just remember coming here um, and I uh, got a job interview and I was offered a job. And um, I remember leaving after I was offered a job, you're supposed to be excited. You know what I'm saying? You're about to get a probably a sixty, seventy thousand dollar job straight out of college, ten thousand dollar advance to move to Chicago. Psh, you know what I'm saying? Parents, everybody's excited. But I remember leaving and being like, nah, this ain't it. Mm. Cause I felt like I wasn't doing my due diligence when it came to following through and chasing my dreams. And you felt that in that moment? I felt that in that moment. Yeah. So I went back, I went back home and I set all my family down and I told them pretty much. Um that this uh, this is what's gonna happen from this point. I went to the job interview, I did my due diligence there, and now I'm gonna take the next four to six months to chase my dreams. So I packed my bags, took all the money I had, I moved down to Florida and started training for the draft without knowing that I was gonna be drafted. I didn't really know what was gonna happen. My college roommate at the time, he stayed down there in Florida, he was from Miami, so I was able to shack up on him and, um, and just got on a journey together, you know what I'm saying? And um, it wasn't until after the process kind of took its toll with the, the pro day and all the evaluations that go on in between that a lot of people don't know about. I went through that process, but I, I still didn't get drafted. So now uh, I remember not getting drafted and it was uh, probably one of the lower points of my life. You know what I mean? Uh, and it's funny, I'm able to smile about it now, but I remember my mom, it was the, the Sunday after the draft was over, you know, we go to church. And that morning, man, I just wasn't feeling it. So um, I was really down. So I just got in my car and I just drove. I just drove off. And, um, you know, I remember my mom and my brother at the time really being there for me and like consoling me, telling me like, you know, everything is gonna be all right. My brother actually came and found me. Um, I drove all the way to my high school and I was just sitting in the parking lot of the high school field. And I was just thinking about everything. Like, cause I was really down on myself. Like, I'm like, damn, like, I felt like I failed. You know what I mean? But um, my family was there for me during that time. And um, even after that, you know, I still I got a few tryouts here and there. Um, I even went to Canada to play in the CFL really? before I ever got into the NFL. Um, I went to Canada. I remember me and a, a guy drove nine hours to Montreal because we were uh, signed to play for the Montreal Alouettes. And about a week and a half into that, I got cut and I had to come back home. And I was working landscaping and I was a bouncer Wow! at a club. I was like security. Do people know about this? Nobody knows okay. about this. Were you embarrassed to say this at the time? You know, I wasn't embarrassed because, you know what's cool about it? Nobody expected, nobody could sit there and say they expected me or they knew that they, they expected me to make it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's not like, I only disappointed myself. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? To others, I was just taking life's course. You know what I'm saying? Oh, he went to college. Yeah, he played. Oh, man. Yeah, it didn't work out. He's probably going to, you know, get a job or whatever. And I was like, okay, so I'm used to being in a position where people underrate my capabilities or what I'm able to do. So I'm not, I wasn't really phased by the embarrassment. But I think what it did to, for me was it brought me to a point to where my back was against the wall and I knew that it can only go up from here. And you knew that at the time? I knew that at the time it can only go up from here. Here I am, a college graduate. I turned down a $60,000 a year job to chase my dreams, and now it didn't work out. So now I'm back home, pretty much living out of my parents' house or trying to still figure it out because, you know, college was over, obviously, after that. And I pretty much put myself in this situation because I wanted to follow through with my dreams. So to me, that was like rock bottom, and the only way it could go is up. You know what I mean? And it was really at the time... Um, for me, it was about staying down, you know what I mean? And, and I, I was working like as if I was in the, I was going to the NFL. Like I was still preparing. I would go to work, I would work landscaping and then I would come home at like five or six and then go get my workout in. Mm -hmm. As if like I'm one of the guys that's um, gonna get picked up still. So for me, it never really dawned on me that it wasn't gonna be a possibility or it, it wasn't really a level of embarrassment, for yeah. real. It was just, you know, you got to keep working. Your time going to come. Stay ready so you don't have to get ready. You know, just keep telling myself different things like that. You know what I mean? I always told myself that if I stopped working, 
or if I stop working out, if I stop staying in shape, if I stop pursuing this, that's when it'll stop happening for me. Because yeah. it, it, it'll be a manifestation that I don't believe. You know what I mean? So I didn't wanna, I didn't wanna even put myself in that, in that type of place. So I just kept working. So it wasn't until July 29th, mm -hmm. 2015, is when I got the call. You know, um, uh, from who? The Tampa Bay Buccaneers. They called me. It was my second time with them on a tryout. Um, I had went to a tryout after the draft. Um, at the time, what people don't know is the NFL is a numbers game. You know what I mean? They may really like you. You may really be a good player, but they may be either full at your position or they may already have people on the roster. So for me, not being like one of those top prospects, it was a numbers game for me. It was about trying to get in where I could fit in. Even when I went to Canada, it wasn't that I wasn't talented because clearly I ended up playing in the NFL, but it ended up being a numbers game. You get caught in the politics of all of it. You know what I mean? So for me, it was learning how to deal with that and you know, knowing that, man, I still got to stay with it because it could be my time. I could get that call. So that call for me came July 29th. That was like two days before all NFL training camps opened. Um, and I went down there. We did another workout tryout. And, you know, God willing, it went great. Um, I was signed um, to, to the Buccaneers as an as a undrafted free agent on that day. And that's where kind of the NFL journey began from that point. So you go from being a bouncer, mm -hmm. and not knowing your future, interviewing for corporate roles, and now being, and this was reported that you you throughout your career, your short career, made under $2 million. How did that resonate with you? Or how did that make you feel? But then I have a double question to that. How did that impact relationships that you had with people? So I'm gonna start off by saying this, that figure that he just named, completely inflated and completely out of context. Now I'm just playing. Yeah. Um, a lot of people see those numbers and then they're like, oh man, like everybody that's playing in the film must be rich. You know what I mean? So I hear uh, how you said that, but I was an undrafted free agent, so for what that needs to mean for the public and people to understand, most people that come into a situation like me, no matter what those numbers say, we're on a year-to-year, -year, week to week, day-to-day right. -day agreement. Right. No football contracts are really guaranteed for people like me. So when I got in there, I understood that every day I had to earn my check. Every day I had to earn my spot. Every day I had to earn, you know, my place in where I was. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking about high level, high performance arena where they're paying people a lot of money to perform at a very high level. Yeah. You know what I mean? So for me, it was one of them things where I never even looked at it like that or thought about the money because I never played for money, bro. You know what I mean? I really, really, truly love the game. I have a, I had a, I still have, I have an unwavering passion for the game of football. Yeah. Because football kind of shaped the man that I am. Yeah. With all the lessons and, you know, the things that you learn and being in the game, it's the ultimate team game. You need the other man in order to be successful. Yeah. There's no other way around it. But isn't, okay, so help me understand this. Mm -hmm. So even me, I like my job, I even love my job in some regards, but I think the monetary compensation for some people is it not still more than most Americans or more, most people make globally? Absolutely. Right? So then to that, zoom out of your perspective for a second. For someone like your mom, mm -hmm. or who's never seen that, or your brother, or your friends who haven't seen that, now assume, that you have all this money. And that might not necessarily be the case for you. Also take into consideration who your circle now is. You're now involved with people that are making now 40, 30 times more than you, right? Yeah. yeah. Explain, explain that. Um, Just for clarity for the man, audience. No, thankfully, man, my family was great during that time. You know what I mean? My family um, was very supportive. They stayed very grounded because they always knew that they never looked at it like, just because I'm now, I just entered the NFL, that wasn't an end goal, that wasn't an end game. Just because I'm in the NFL now, the goal was to thrive in the NFL, you know what I mean? So they never wanted to put me in a position where, you know, um, money or things kind of, you know, changed the way our relationship or our dynamic. My family really stayed very grounded. Now, what I did do for myself and took it upon myself is to try to take care of and relieve any burden that my family had, mm -hmm. you know, no, regardless of you know, how much money I had at the time, my goal was to make sure that like, whatever stressors or whatever burdens that my parents had at the time, they had to worry about it no more. You know what I'm saying? Whether it was a car, whether it was a, you know, bills, whether it was, whatever it was, I had to make sure that I sat down with them and figured out a plan on how I could best. Because to me, this was, I was, I was God's way of looking out for my parents. You know what I mean? Coming over here as an immigrant child, I came over here when I was nine years old. We moved here from Italy, you know what I'm saying? 
I can't even begin to explain, you know what I'm saying, the things that we went through to even try to get everybody here or try to get everybody through school and try to get everybody. So for me, my responsibility, I owe that to my parents to figure out how I can best help them out because there were no 401k for them, ain't no retirement plan. You know what I mean? They moved here in the middle of their, of their life pretty much. You know what I mean? So I was the retirement plan. I am the retirement plan, I should say. You know what I mean? So for me, I really took that upon myself to make sure that, you know, I took care of them and, and obviously their, their glaring needs, you know what I'm saying? And not necessarily their wants, you know what I mean? So I think that's what made the relationship so cool and the dynamic so cool between myself and my family is that everybody understood that and, um, you know, they just, they were just supportive. Yeah. Uh, they were just supportive. Yeah. Another question I have. So for me personally, right, throughout my career, there have been different things that have happened or in life that people might have the facts misconstrued or may not know. But I will say there are people that have the misconception that the reason why you are no longer in the NFL is because of something that happened during your journey. And I'd love to give the opportunity to clarify. So, so this was released and it said that the nickel back for the Buccaneers had been suspended for violating the NFL's policy on performance enhancing substances according to a league spokesperson. What happened there? Cool, so um, that was a very hard time. Yeah. That was a very hard time because um, that did kind of change the trajectory of everything. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, you know, it was a great, it started off as a great story, undrafted free agent, you know, became a starter, you know, in my, my first year. Um, so I could see how, you know, the perception of it was, yeah. was kind of like, you know, made out to be. But the truth of the matter is, man, I did nothing wrong. Um, the NFL has a, lift, a list of banned substances uh, that people are allowed to take, or are not allowed to take, I should say. And those range. Um, a lot of those times, these are um, things that the NFL has tested that you know, they think that can give people an edge. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you know, everything that is on there is a performance enhancing drug. Right. So what happened for me was, um, I was having a little knee pain, knee issue, tendonitis it was at the time, and I was taking fish oils. Mm. Fish oils that most people just buy when they go to CVS or they go to Walgreens, you know what I mean? That's just what they buy to kind of, you know, relieve pain, inflammation, and different things like that to kind of help joint pain. So that's what I thought I was taking. Little did I know that that batch that I got was contaminated with an anabolic steroid that was banned by the NFL. So here I am taking uh, fish oils in August, then I get a test later on in the season, and I get a letter saying that, yeah, there was a substance that was detected, you know, um, in, in your sample that basically is a performance enhancer. And I'm like, man, look, I knowingly never took any performance enhancing drugs or anything like that. I was taking fish oils. And it just happened to be that I got a bad batch that was contaminated. And honestly, once I got in there, I learned to understand that that was something that can happen to anybody. It's happened to a lot of people. It's happened to Hall of Famers. Yeah. It's happened to people who have played one year, two games, whatever you want to call it, and everybody in between. Uh, it just came at a time for me where, uh, you know, it was an un unfortunate, you know, time, uh, it, especially that season because we were kind of like, you know, we were in the playoff hunt and different things like that, and that was really like a big part of what we were doing that year. Um, so, yeah, that definitely set me back, but that's not the reason why I'm not in the NFL no more because – um, even after that, after that incident, I was re-signed by the team the next year. Yeah. Um, so if they thought that it was really like, you know, that I had a drug problem or anything like that, like. Yeah. And I actually read that. This actually reported that you actually were not in the NFL because of actual like knee injury. Yes. Or something like that. So my career uh, definitely got started out because of injuries. Um, the following year after that, 2017, um, I, um, I broke my kneecap for the second time that was. And it was like kind of like a six to eight month span within those injuries happening. So pretty gruesome injury. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of times when you suffer that type of gruesome injury in a short amount of time like that, it takes a lot to recover. So I really had to take like the next year, year and a half really to bounce back. I was rehabbing for about a year, year and a half before I ever even returned to like even being able to go back into the circle of, you know, doing visits and tryouts and different things like that. And it really came to a point to where, like, physically I was back, but nobody was willing to take a chance on me anymore, really. It was because of injury. Yeah. Yeah. You, so you go through the process of every team you go to or every, after an injury, you know, you go through a physical. 
and I just couldn't pass the physical. A lot of the doctors were saying that the knee had gotten to the point to where no team was willing to really take a risk on me anymore financially. So when that happened, it wasn't even no more like my hand was forced. You get what I'm saying? My hand was forced into not being able to play no more. And really, um, it happened at a time where I felt like I was just entering my prime. You know what I mean? I had just turned 25, about to be 26. So for me, it was like, yeah, and now it's time. It was my third year going into my fourth year. So I'm like, yeah, now it's time. You know, it's really time to kick things up a notch and really kick it in full throttle. But obviously, God had other plans. Yeah. In the moment, though, right? So I talk about mistakes that I've made throughout my career, some recent, some more um, in the past. In the moment, going through something like that. So I heard you at the beginning of the conversation say, like, you know, like I was the pinnacle of my career. When you lose something like that, did you feel in that moment that you had hit rock bottom? Or how did it fuck with you? Like, truthfully? I was in denial. I was in denial for a long time, I would say. Um, because there had never been in a, a point in my life where I haven't overcome adversity. So to me, this was just an adverse moment in my life. Oh, you're injured. Oh, they're saying you can't play. Oh, nah, just keep working. Just keep grinding. Like, you'll find your way back. You know what I'm saying? So I never really looked at it as like, you know, rock bottom or anything like that at first because the, the idea that it was over for me would, had not set in. You know what I'm saying? I just saw this as an obstacle. And I just had to figure out a solution to overcome this obstacle. But then when I started learning, as time started going on, that a lot of these things, these things were out of my control. And when, you're, when things are out of your control and you try to put your energy towards trying to dictate them, or trying to, you put your energy and you put everything into the outcome of what it's going to be, um, that's when we get disappointed. And that's when things started, you know, hitting rock bottom is when I'm starting to go to all these teams and I'm failing these physicals. And, you know, I even played in an alternative league in 2019 that had started up. It was a spring league. My agent had told me to go play in it so that I could get some fi I had been out like about a year, year and a half. So he was like, go there, you know, get you some film and then, you know, play in the spring. And then by the fall, you know, NFL team going to sign you. You know what I'm saying? You have experience. Oh, da, da, da. So I go out there and I felt like, man, this was like my second chance. Thank you, God. I'm so I'm back now. My knee was good. You know what I mean? Or at least my knee was to the point where I felt like I could go back now and, you know, go out there and do my thing and be the Jude I'm supposed to be. And then uh, we played in the first game in that league and I pretty much dislocate my wrist. And I lose about, I want to say I lost about 60 percent of range of motion in my wrist. It was totally dislocated. I had to have two surgeries to really put my wrist back in place. And um, even as we speak now, like most of my wrist and things like are fused. And that was really what ended it, that, that the wrist injury in that league. Um, after that, it was over. Like, and I think that's the, that's the point where I hit rock bottom. I, I asked myself, I was like, man, this must be a sign from God that it's time to do something else. Yeah. Cause there's no way I've been grinding for a year and a half to recover from two knee injuries, to go out there and hurt my wrist. You know what I mean? Like that was kind of one of the moments when I was like, yeah, man, like there's gotta be a sign from God. How'd you feel in that moment? You know, it was kind of like how it was um, when I initially didn't get drafted or didn't get picked. You know, I felt defeated. I felt like, you know, um, I had put something, I had put, my all into something and I wasn't able to get the outcome that I wanted. So there was a lot of disappointment. But once again, at that moment, my mom was there. <laughs> my, mom, uh, my mom was there um, and she, she told me like, you're gonna be all right. Like, you know, um, and she was just there for me at a time where I felt like, you know, man, like my career was really over. It started feeling like this might be my last, my last time. So. Um, I just felt defeated. I kind of felt like, you know, I needed uh, to really think about what, what was, what was going to happen next because yeah. um, football might have been over at that moment. Yeah. Following uh, Jude's um, planned exit from the NFL, uh, relocated to Arizona at some point, and my team caught up with him at his home uh, in Arizona to kind of see how he is in his own element. So here's some of that footage right now.
back in like the 70s and the 80s. This was like considered like Beverly Hills of Phoenix. So. It's really higher, higher end. Yeah, a lot of executives, a lot of business owners, a lot of politicians uh, live in this area. You know, because a lot of Chicago influences out here. Yeah. Because this city was built by the Wrigley's, mm. Wrigley family. Okay. So, um, matter of fact, at the top of the mountain, when we go to the other rooftop, you're going to see there was a mansion sitting at the top of the hill. It's the Wrigley Mansion. Wow. So they built everything. Really? They built everything. They built the city. They moved out here and built the city. But that's why now you see Maple and Nash. You see a bunch of Chicago-based okay. businesses, the franchises. Vibes, yeah. And they didn't try to be, bring Harold's wouldn't come out here, so they just started Chicago Chicken Shack. Mm. And now they opening them up everywhere. And it's yeah. just, it's the same recipe. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? It's just that Harold's wouldn't let him take the name. Yeah. But I also wanted to go somewhere where I feel like there was an opportunity for the most growth. And, you know, like I said, somewhere also where I could be comfortable. It's warm here. Um, <laughs> being from Ohio, I was kind of sick of the cold weather. So I'm like, man, it wouldn't be bad waking up to the sun every day and then just being able to, you know, um, just be somewhere where I don't really know anybody and kind of be able to like reinvent yourself. For me, it, it really starts with in the morning. Um, I try to just ground myself waking up, uh, some form of prayer, some form of meditation, a combination of the both, um, just to kind of get everything centered and kind of just be present, you know what I'm saying? To start my day, make sure that my energy is right moving forward. Um, not as consistently as I would like to, and I probably need to be more consistent at that, but we're working on that. Um, and I go to therapy. I see a therapist. I was at my best when I had structure. You see, when you're playing football or you're playing any organized sports, from the time you start Little League or AU or high school, or whatever it is, there's structure. And I operate best under structure. You know what I mean? It's just that now under this environment, there's nobody telling me where to be or what to do at this time in order to reap some type of reward. It all has to be really done through self-discipline. Um, and what I realized is when I got done playing, I kind of let that structure kind of just go, you know, because I kind of didn't know what to do. There was nobody there to tell me what to do or where to go. I have to be here at this time. So I had to build that within myself. I was a football player. That was who I was, is what I did. It was everything. You know what I mean? So therapy for me came at a point to where football, the game was taken away from me. And now I don't know who I am. Because for so long, I've attached my self-worth and value towards something that somebody else decided whether I got to do or not. You know what I mean? And the moment that's taken away from you and you're stripped of that identity, you kind of lost. You kind of like, you know, man, what do I do now? That's why you see a lot of athletes, you know, a lot of us struggle a lot of times after, you know, our playing days because it's like, what do you do? You know what I mean? Uh, most people go to school, become doctors, and they get to do that for 30, 35 years. Or you become a lawyer, or you become a photographer, or you become whatever it is, you get to follow your passion. But sports and athletics, at some point, it's over. And a lot of times, it's over way before you're ready. And it's not over on your terms. So as an individual, how do you deal with that? And, and it's really important for kids and individuals in general, and not just athletes. I think nobody should really put their self-worth and value into something that they cannot control. Because the moment it's stripped from you or the moment something doesn't go your way, it blows up your self-esteem. Um, but they ended up building this Lifetime Fitness Gym. Yeah. So once they built it, and we seen that this space was up for lease. Mm -hmm. We like, man, you know, this would be a perfect right. location yeah. for a recovery studio where we do athletic recovery, and for the past year and a half, this is where we operated a business out of. I love being a business owner. It's what I've always envisioned myself, you know, ultimately doing. Especially when I got to the point to where I, you know, I got done playing and I'm like, all right. Most of my peers graduated college, you know, four or five years ago, four or five years ago, and they either continue their education or they got into the workforce and have gained experience. 
So they're at a certain point in their life professionally. Unfortunately, no matter how many years you play in the NFL, whether you play, you know, three or four like me, or you play 10, 15 years, companies don't look at that as experience of you knowing how to do anything. So you still have to go back and enter the workforce in a space where you don't have any experience. You may have a college education, but you're in the same boat that somebody who graduated college four or five years may be at. So for me, I just looked at the time and the resources that I've spent, and I looked at it as, okay, I can go fill out an application and go clock in at somebody's job, and be very secure with a nine to five and a salary and benefits and all that good stuff. Or I could really roll the dice and take a chance on myself. I'm not really in the pursuit of happiness as much as I've been in the pursuit of peace. Because I think happiness is an emotion, once again, that is um, a lot of times for people is contingent on external forces and things that, you know, monetary things and outside things. Few people are really happiness or happy within. You know what I'm saying? They wait for things to happen to them or for them in order to be happy. But when you at peace, you know what I'm saying? That's different. That was so good. <laughs> that was so good, man. That was really good. The thing I liked the most about what you said was um, about therapy. I talked to someone that said to me, Jude, going to therapy made it okay for me. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think it's so stigmatized and so powerful when people are able to admit, especially black men are able to admit, how has therapy impacted you? Therapy has been great, man. Therapy has been great. Um, I can't even think of where I'd be right now, you know, in terms of my self-development as a man, if I didn't open up to the concept of having a therapist and seeing a therapist. Was it easy to open up to that concept? Um, I'm gonna be honest with you. The first time I went to therapy, um, I went because I was looking for answers. You know what I mean? I'm like, man, I need to go to somebody that's gonna validate whether I'm crazy or I'm, am I crazy? Like, am I thinking about this the wrong way? Am I looking at this? So I was really looking at like, I was looking at, at it from a standpoint where I had a situation where, um, you know, I was like, man, I need to, I need validation. I need somebody to tell me. But then I got in there and I realized that's not what therapy is about. And it was really like a journey to really self-discovery in a way of getting in touch with myself and just realizing like, man, like, I am, I've been through a bunch of life experiences that have shaped my thinking, my actions, my behavior, the way I interact with people, my relationships. And a lot of times, you know, I didn't know whether I was moving in the right direction with things I was doing or things, uh, you know, or, you know, where I was going. So therapy helped me ground myself, you know what I'm saying? It helped me find a place where, you know, I sat down and started, you know, thinking about what are my core values? You know what I mean? What are the things that I live by or I've been living by that have made me this is because I, I probably should really stick to those. You know what I mean? It just made me really take a look inside internally at myself and really figure out, all right, how can I really move forward using everything that I've learned, my life experiences, and everything in a positive way yeah. and not let my trauma and everything like that, you know, impact me negatively. That's what I think therapy did for me. Yeah. Yeah. I started going, I said this in the past episode, I started going to therapy when I was in Dallas. And it became this thing that I actually look forward to every week. Yeah, like, you know, yeah, like, it's crazy, right? Yeah, sometimes for some people, going to therapy requires you to reach that rock bottom, where it's like you need something, you need some validation to work through something. It's like your last resort, particularly those of us that come. Well, I'm, I'm gonna say this, man. Mm -hmm. I started going to therapy probably at a point to where, in most people's eyes, I had nothing to be down about. Dude, I, I remember it was a time where I had the most money I ever had and I was the most depressed I ever been. But I had exactly what I say. I had the, my dream car, everything. The Audi? The Audi, you know it. <laughs> dream car, dream everything, dream life, man. Yeah. And I was still the most depressed I ever been. But that's also where I learned that I really, really loved the game of football because I was at a point to where I was injured, but I was still on the team. I was getting paid, you know what I'm saying? I had money, everything. But I was like, man, I didn't, I didn't do this for the money. I miss being out there with the guys. I miss being in the locker room. I miss the smell of the grass, man. I miss like hitting somebody, man. I miss, you know, talking shit. Like that's what I miss. And even at that point, I was like, man, 
that's when it kind of hit me hard and it, I, I kind of realized that, man, I'm really, really attached to this game. You know what I'm saying? I'm really, really attached. Pretty much, I'm consumed by it. Was it ego? Did you have a big ego? I have a, I'm very ego driven. Yeah. Let's get that out the way right now, okay? I would say about- Thank you for your honesty, I mean. Nah, man, that's what we're here for. We're being transparent. I'm very ego driven. A lot of the things that I do, I consider um, my ego first a lot of times. So at that point in the time when I went to therapy, I'm not a book reader. I didn't become a book reader probably until 2018 when I read Ego is the Enemy by Ryan Holiday. Did it help you start to identify when your ego was at play? Man, it's, it helped me pretty much figure out why I've been going through everything I've been going through because I've put my ego in a place where I look at my ego as a completely different person. Mm -hmm. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? I get that. So I try to feed it because I like watching it grow. I like, I like seeing it. That's good, Drew. You get what I'm saying? That's good. I feed it, I do things to feed it. You know what I'm saying? Whether it's, you know, uh, dressing up, looking nice. Now, one thing about that is, is that that ain't never gonna stop. But the, 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 the fact of the matter is, is that we do things every day. We buy material things, we go places, we take trips. Um, you know, we do a bunch of things to really feed our ego and make ourselves feel good. And, you know, it's all because of our self-esteem. But that's when I realized that my ego and my self-esteem, my self-worth was all embedded into an identity of being a football player. So the reason why I was depressed and I was down at that time is because here I am, I'm supposed to be a football player and I ain't not on the field. Now, what is your ego going to tell you about that? None of the material stuff around me means anything if I'm not because out there. Because that's your, that's, I get it. I get it. And I realized I got to a point to where like, I was worshiping my ego. I was doing things in life that were pretty much, I was worshiping my ego. I was feeding my ego so much, my ego had become damn near God. You know what I'm saying? To where I was like, no wonder you're having all these issues and all these problems and you're, th you're, you're going through overthinking and you're worried about this and you're worried about that. It's because you're doing it all to feed the ego, man. And you don't even, in all actuality, you don't even know what truly makes you happy as Jude because you've been living through your ego. All yeah, you've surrounded yourself with all these things that you think make you happy. You know what I'm saying? You, people have a, a art of, you know, they know what happiness looks like because they're able to dress it up. You know what I mean? That's why in the clip I talk about peace because having peace and having a peace of mind, that's deeply rooted in knowing who you are. That's deeply rooted in knowing who you are. Have you figured out how to know who you are? Who are you? Who am I? Um, I think that's a very, very, very good question because um, I'm a lot of things. Um, for me, I'm a former now, I'm a former NFL player. I'm an entrepreneur. I like to look at myself as a philanthropist. I'm a brother, I'm a son. You get what I'm saying? And you know, obviously moving on, there'll be a bunch of more titles that I expect to add, you know? father, husband, whatever that is, but um, wholeheartedly, I think my purpose and what I really, when I thought about it, my divine purpose is really to motivate people, to help people, and to really tap into and figure out things. Because the way I look at it, I've been blessed with opportunities and access to places and people that most people where I come from don't get that. So. It's my duty to go out here, go get these experiences, go get this knowledge. Even if I got to go and do something to bump my head and fail just so somebody can learn that that's not the way you're supposed to do it, that's all part of my purpose. You know what I'm saying? I'm a survivor, I would say. And I, I, I like that in a, in a way of, you know, it makes me feel good about myself in a way that I can say that. But it's also kind of been part of my realization that I've been living in survival mode for so long that I now need to learn of how to kind of unwind that about myself and just learn how to take things easy sometimes, you know what I mean? Um, because I always move like my back is against the wall and I always got something to prove and I'm trying to get ahead, you know what I mean? And that comes with a price. Yeah. That comes with a price. Yeah. I love that. So as a business owner, mm -hmm. what does that talk to you about yourself? You said something on the phone when we talked back in August, I want to say. Yeah. You said being a business owner, you have to learn boundaries. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Boundaries. Uh, something that also therapy helped me 
kind of figure out. But you have to learn boundaries because the fact of the matter is, is that uh, going in business for yourself is very challenging because you're in a position where you're at the top and everything works off of you. You set, the, you set the practices, you set the procedures, you put the systems in place, but you have to hire properly. You have to make sure that you have a good plan. You have to make sure that you're able to lead. You have to make sure that you're able to convey your plan and your message to other people in order to allow them to carry out, carry it out. You know what I mean? And I think for me, the discovery with business has been is that I can't be a control freak. I have to learn how to delegate work, okay? I also have to learn how to have a work-life balance because if I get myself to a point to where my business consumes me in the same way that football consumed me or the things that I've done in the prior that I've always so much attached myself to, because like I said, most people attach themselves to what they do. If you're an accountant, I'm an accountant. That's what I do. So I attach myself to it. But I have to learn how to kind of detach myself a little bit from that. I've had to learn how to depersonalize myself a little bit from those things. And kind of sometimes look at them, looking at them from far away and looking at things for what they are and not always feeling so personal about it. You know what I mean? Because I feel like that sometimes adds to the anxiety and things that people go through that is like, you know, especially when you're so ambitious. You know what I'm saying? Because I like to I'll say this, like life is hard, man. You know what I mean? And for me, if your life ain't hard, you're just not ambitious enough for me. You know what I mean? You're not trying hard enough in life to be something if your life ain't hard. Because to attain good things in life, it takes work. And in work, a, a lot of inner work too. Yeah, yeah, that's part of the work. Yeah, yeah. That's part of the work. Working on ourselves, working on our craft. You know what I'm saying? Working on a lot of things, but it takes work. Yeah. And life is hard. So in order for you to be able to get through the hard life, you've got to have a balance. If not, you crash out. Yeah. You crash out. What is the one thing you want people to know about you after listening to this that they don't already? Um, just that I'm human. You know what I'm saying? I feel like the a lot of the, um, you know, sometimes you get put in a position where, you know, you're looked at. You're in a you're in a higher position. You know, and playing in the NFL or now you know just being an entrepreneur. Um, but I'm human. You know what I'm saying? I make mistakes. I made a ton of mistakes. I continue to make mistakes, but I learn from my mistakes. Um, another, another thing that I would like for people to know is that like, you know, just as men, as black men in general, it's okay to be open. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to, you know what I'm saying? Put yourself in a position where you helping your brother out, you offering game, you know what I'm saying? And giving somebody something and information and knowledge that they wouldn't have access to. You know what I mean? All of those things are important. And I really now pride myself on kind of being that person. You know what I'm saying? Where I'm always offering game. I'm always sharing information because that's how we get better. That's how we learn. That's how we evolve. That's how we grow. You know what I mean? So that's really what um, I want people to know about me is that like um, football was not the greatest thing that I, you know, I was able to achieve, you know, and at that point it might have been the greatest thing that I was able to achieve. But I think I got a lot more that I, you know, I could tap into. And that's what I, I really have been telling myself now is that if I look back at my life now and think, man, football is the greatest thing that I've ever done, then I ain't did much. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Because that was only a short time of my life. You know, and they say nothing good lasts forever, but nothing bad lasts forever either. So I really try to be even kill. I'm a really even kill person. I try not to get high. I try not to get too high on my highs and not too low on my lows. And I think that keeps me grounded. It keeps me level headed. Um, you know, it keeps my emotions in check. You know, I try to move with logic over emotion and a lot of things that I do, you know what I'm saying? Because emotions a lot of times come and go, but if you're rooted in a logic that is really attached to your core values and things that you believe, you'll never be wrong. You'll never feel out of place, you know what I'm saying? You'll always feel like you're in your lane, and that's one thing that I've always been in. I've been in my own lane. I've always been in my own lane, doing my own thing, running the race at my own pace. And I never look right, I never look left. I don't care what nobody else doing, you know what I'm saying? To me. You know what I'm saying? Life is my race. I'm running at my pace and, you know, I'm not competing, man. That's one thing. I'm not competing. Well, Jude, I really appreciate this talk. The really good ones come when I learn something. Mm -hmm. See, I recently had this self-discovery about myself. About myself having a really big ego. Because I never really um, accepted it because you become so familiar with yourself. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think it's powerful because I think you said that I think resonated, man, like you worship your ego. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming to Chicago in spite of the cold. Man, nah, it was great, man. Tell us people about your man. business website, your uh, pro zone. Definitely, you. man. If you guys are ever in Phoenix, Arizona and are looking for a place to refresh your bodies and you got pains and aches that you need to deal with, definitely check out Pro Recovery Zone. We're located in Central Phoenix, website, ProRecoveryZone.com. We're on all the social media platforms, giving you health and wellness tips all the time, holistic things, you know, just things that you can do to kind of give you an edge, give you that next best day in the gym or at work. At the end of the day, we're all professionals, and no matter what we do, our bodies are temple. We need to make sure we're taking care of it as such. So that's why I got into space. So thank you for having me. I appreciate the platform. Thank all right, man. Thank you. Rolling off. Uh, yeah. Take off my shoes and put on my crappy clothes. That was good, man. Yeah, that was great. That was really good. Yeah. That was great. Yeah. Hey, 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 hey. Great talk. Uh, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was a bad, a bad thing. What? No, we, I mean, what she called out was like, fuck. But, but you got, I mean, this is real though. People, you wanna. It's real, but sometimes you don't wanna look like a nigga. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? I am really nervous, but I'm really excited. I'm excited because the first episode of season two. Everybody working, the creative juice is flowing. And I'm looking forward to the conversation with the guests. Did you know what's really interesting about the episode? It's almost like it it, 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 it comes out the way it's supposed to come out. And then that, like, it's almost like it, 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 bur it burps itself. Does that make sense? It's like you can plan it, but it's like it's going to be. Mom, hold on. Hi, Mom. <laughs> 